Lawmakers were certainly busy this week putting the final touches on the National Defense Authorization Act. In the process of doing so, they snuck in a provision that intends to silence military personnel and suppress the Internet uh, and purge certain information. One such proposal even bars the military from engaging with a civil rights group advocating for separation of church and state. Here to elaborate on the details of these changes is investigative journalist Lee Fong. Welcome, Lee. Thanks for having me. It's so nice to have you in studio. No, it's great to see you guys. Tell us more about this reporting. You do such good deep dives onto things like these huge NDAA, NDAA bills where lots of people have tried to attach a lot of stuff. What is this religious freedom situation that's unfolding? Well, you know, every two years there's a military reauthorization bill. This is typically just for, you know, troop pay raises and other kind of benign issues around the military, but we see it as an opportunity for lawmakers to slip sometimes unrelated provisions mm -hmm. and force them uh, through the power of law. Um, uh, again, this, is, this process is happening, and without any debate, uh, in the House Armed Services Committee, uh, Chairman Mike Turner slipped in a provision that bars members of the military from speaking to the uh, Military Religious Freedom Foundation. This is a very controversial civil rights organization that encourages a secular military. They push back mm -hmm. uh, against what they see as inappropriate uh, boundary cost crossing uh, for, from church and state, you know, Bibles uh, on military bases and in barracks, um, you know, military leaders proselytizing. You know, there's a big controversy in Afghanistan with uh, soldiers kind of having Bible inscriptions on, on their rifles or crusader imagery on some of their, mm -hmm. their patches. Um, they litigate, they pressure, they kind of act as a legal resource for um, members of the military to push back against what they see as inappropriate. This provision, which is now advancing very swiftly uh, in the House, or it's passed the House, it's now going to the Senate, uh, bars the military from speaking to the leader of the Military Religious Freedom Foundation, Mikey mm -hmm. Weinstein. Um, it bars uh, the military from taking any action based on a petition or report from the Military Religious Freedom Foundation. It's kind of extraordinary in how it silences the military from even speaking to this organization. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's very frustrating. So this is something a Republican slipped in? Is... This, this is something a Republican yeah. slipped in, but it was voted by unanimous consent in the committee, meaning Democrats like Rokana uh, supported it. Oh my God. Do you think it flew under the radar or what's going on? Because we did just have this whole blow up over um, conservative led efforts to cut Ukraine funding and also attach um, some conditions to service members not being able to access um, reproductive rights and there was some trans rights legislation that there was a lot of pushback about and ended up not making it through. Why do you think that this particular uh, addition doesn't seem to have gotten the same kind of pushback. That's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> this is, I mean, an extreme version of censorship, you know, saying mm -hmm. that you can't speak not just to any organization, a civil rights organization. You know, this is not some rinky dink group that's got uh, many cases under its belt. Uh, it's fought some prominent fights with the military. It's been around since 2005, over a decade. Um, and why there is no debate about this provision, why there's been basically no mainstream media coverage, uh, kind of baffles me. Um, but we'll see. Maybe it's uh, going to be stripped out in the Senate. Well, maybe it will receive some debate there. But you know, we, we kind of see the corporate media, the mainstream media, coalescing around just a few issues within the NDAA that they kind of are obsessively discussing. The drag show ban, uh, you know, some abortion-related issues. You know, sure, sure, that's a valid cause, but there's a lot of other very interesting provisions in this bill. You know, Republicans have made um, freedom of conscience uh, for people in the military. Uh, they've talked about it prominently with respect to vaccines. Um, that kind of, you know, being very um, upset that that this decision would be taken away from service members, that this would be something that, you know, the administration would force on them. Uh, so it would seem like, to, in order to not be hypocritical, you, you would have to avoid doing things like that. This seems like an indirect conflict with with everything they were talking about with respect to it should be their choice, it shouldn't be forced well, on them. This morning, uh, we had the Special Weaponization Committee have a whole hearing convened by Republicans to discuss issues around censorship and free speech. Mm -hmm. Here we are having some of the same House Republicans uh, advancing an NDA that explicitly silences speech. Um, that doesn't mean that the hearing today wasn't 
uh, airing valid issues, but there is clearly a tension there and inconsistency. Yeah, you wrote about um, in your article on the subject some more pointedly uh, uh, censorship-related concerns that come up here. You say that the amendment grants the authority to erase private data collected by smartphone apps and, uh, and other digital apps. Can you unpack what, what that's all about? Yeah, so there's a separate amendment uh, advancing in the Senate for the NDAA that um, builds on a rapidly passed, again with no debate, uh, law that back in December, you know, without any kind of legislative discussion, legislators slipped in a, a bill in the omnibus spending bill. This is another kind of must-pass legislation where lawmakers like to kind of slide in controversial provisions um, that gave federal judges the power and their families the power uh, to compel businesses and online platforms to delete information that relates to their personal information, their home residence, their phone number, social security number, whatever, out of security concerns for federal judges. Now, Amy Klobuchar, Democrat, and Ted Cruz, Republican, are expanding radically upon that. They're saying any member of Congress, their family, their roommates, even at-risk um, members of uh, the kind of employment base of the House, you know, congressional staff, if anyone feels um, you know, threatened in any way, they should have the power to demand that Google, Facebook, all these other sites, as well as private businesses, remove any private information that might threaten them. So, you know, that's, again, that's phone numbers, uh, uh, email addresses, which I'm not sure how that threatens them, uh, sure. you know, home residence addresses. I mean, this is extraordinary powers for Congress to censor the Internet. Right, and that, that speaks to many of the hearings we're having, all, you know, the disclosures that you've been part of, some of them having to do with uh, with Twitter and the pressure that was put on that, all the social media companies facing tremendous pressure to take down content. And it, it, Republicans have sounded very worked up about this. I agree with a lot of their complaints here. Uh, it would seem uh, almost so <laughs> psychotically short-sighted to give the government more of a mandate to do speech takedowns on social media, given the vast history of what we've witnessed over the last few years. Well, listen, uh, you know, I, I, there are valid security concerns. You know, there was that shooter that targeted congressional Republicans at the congressional baseball sure. game. That was, a, that was a left-wing shooter. There are many right-wing shooters and, you know, uh, extremists that have threatened Democrats. You know, there was someone just arrested last year for threatening uh, Pramila Jayapal, House Democrat, outside of we her home. We just had this Barack Obama story where the Donald Trump tweeted, tweeted out this article that listed his Colorama address, mm -hmm. um, and there was an arrest. Just We talked about this maybe two weeks yeah. ago. So they're valid concerns, but, you know, if you, as a public official, you're trading some of your, yeah. your uh, privacy for increased scrutiny. That's just part of the job. And, you know, it's not like we don't take security seriously in Congress, they just passed just a few years ago an, an additional, on top of the very high security budget, special $2 billion extension in the Capitol Police budget, mm -hmm. lots of new security measures, as I'm sure you guys know. If, if you've been to Capitol Hill, you can kind of feel it's palpable how much more security there is there. And, you know, the, the, at the end of the day, if you're allowing members of Congress to delete broad amounts of information from the internet, you're not just blocking the public from knowing, you're blocking journalists, a big part of reporting on corruption, stories that I've done in the past, a lot of that uh, special interest influence not just goes directly to members of Congress, The actually the more likely uh, target of, of special influence peddling and, and bribes and, you know, whatever you want to call it, uh, goes to family members, you know, a, a spouse, a son, an uncle getting hired to an energy company. You know, I, I wrote about Hunter Biden's work for uh, Burisma, the Ukrainian energy company, back in 2014. Hmm. You know, I was looking up you know, what might be considered private information as I was gathering documents. Marjorie Taylor Greene's waving his photos <laughs> on the House floor. We can't be we can't be too interested in, like, criminalizing the sharing of private information about political figures. If there's a big difference on, between right? a private residence and a naked picture, you yeah. know, like uh, countrywide, the big mortgage bank that bribed members of Congress and got, um, you know, lenient treatment for years from policymakers. How did they do it? They gave special interest, special low interest loans to lawmakers and housing officials. How would you research that story if members of Congress could delete their personal residence information from Ah, but Lee, it says there's a journalism exception here. So oh, that must answer all of your concerns. Yeah, I'm sure all the big platforms are happy to create a whole separate sure. internet just for journalists to yes. research. It's, and it'll be a very <laughs> obvious what's a journalistic inquiry and who qualifies as, as a journalist. These will not be Such categories prone to abuse there. whatsoever. There's never been a any ambiguity about whether someone like Julian Assange is actually yes, a journalist. Yes, that's a good yes. point. Yeah. Uh, you know, it also reminds me of um, the Clarence 
Clarence Thomas corruption investigation cases where so much of it is, well, there was a house that was bought by this person who had a conflict of interest with the court, and it wasn't that he gave Clarence Thomas some money. It's that he purchased a house that was Clarence Thomas's mother or mother-in-law mm -hmm. on this particular street that was nearby. Those kinds of connections I could see being implicated. You know, the research into those kind of connections could be undermined That's a, by a law like this. That's a perfect example because I'm fascinated by this reporting. I've kind of tried to backtrack it and figure out how ProPublica did it. Mm -hmm. And looking at how they found some of the money, it's just it's great you know, journalism, what they did, looking through public documents. You know, for example, how they found that Harlan Crow had paid the tuition uh, for, uh, you know, Clarence Thomas family member, their private tuition. Um, the private school uh, that that family member attended uh, went bankrupt. In the bankruptcy proceedings, you see the invoices mm -hmm. from Harlan Crow. And, and in those invoices, you see a lot of personal, identif you know, identifying information. Again, this is stuff that could be scrubbed from the internet, scrubbed from public websites, from private websites, whatever, uh, government websites and privately owned websites, uh, if, if this amendment comes to pass. Hmm. Do you have any concerns about privacy rights, generally speaking? In Europe, there seems to be more of an emphasis on the right to privacy, the right to disappear, as I think they call it. And while I completely agree with, for public figures, how it would undermine important journalistic investigations and the like, you know, is there any concern that we should, you know, ha talking about this in this way, in this context, is taking away from pr what perhaps might be decent arguments about regular people needing to have more protection as their information is farmed and exploited for profit on the internet so frequently? I think that's a valid conversation. One, we should have that debate in Congress. We should be talking about privacy rights. Mm -hmm. And in Europe, it's the opposite of here. Mm -hmm. In Europe, normal people have stronger privacy rights. Here in America, what we're talking about, normal people have no privacy rights, but only members of Congress have it. It's That's kind of flipped, point. right? You know, um, one interesting provision of the Klobuchar Cruz Amendment is taking a look at data brokers. You know, when you use your weather app, your dating app, your chess app, whatever, you know, they're feeding that information from your phone, your sometimes precise location to these data brokers that then sell them to advertisers. There's been a number of investigations that show, well, a lot of people could buy that same data and know that your, you know, your, your patterns exactly where you are. What are you, what's your path to go from home to work? Mm -hmm. And so, in this amendment, it gives members of Congress the ability to delete information um, from data brokers. Well, guess what? What about everyone else? What about everyone yeah. else? What about you know the person that's being threatened by their spouse or have some other kind of you know domestic violence issue? They don't have the right only if you're a senator and you know you, you have that same right. I, I think all of this is w worthy of discussion. I'm just kind of concerned yeah. about the lopsided nature of this, that this is being slipped in with no debate as an amendment to the NDAA, doesn't have anything to do with the Pentagon, uh, and that there's a, a, a clear inconsistency where are the privacy rights for ordinary Americans, and why should we have this incredibly privileged class of lawmakers? Yeah, absolutely. Well said. I mean, there are these well-known trade-offs between free speech and privacy, and philosophically, it's hard. it can be hard. There can be edge cases that are very hard, I think, to work out, but it's so clear that the government class shouldn't be entitled to a different or more favorable standard to them than anyone else. Lee, thank you so much for stopping by. We really appreciate it. Good to see you guys. And we'll have more Rising right after this.